Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Amen. If you'll be seated. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, you can turn to Romans chapter 8. And our text is taken from verse 28 to verse 30. Uh, in our little series on Christian assurance, because if there's one thing that we're certain about in life, it's this, that there's not anything certain at all. Uh, you go through life and you soon realise that you're unsure about tomorrow, you're unsure about your marriage, you're unsure about your job, you're unsure about your health, and if there's one thing that you are certain about, it is this, that everything's uncertain in everything that we do. But when a person becomes a Christian, there is something that you can be certain about. And I don't know if you've ever met one of those uh, people. Yeah, you call them the born-again Christian or whatever. And if you ask them, are they going to heaven, they would categorically tell you, yes. They know that they've been saved and they know that one day they will be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they say it with such conviction and they say it with such a certainty that the Pope could never know about because the Pope doesn't know these verses and doesn't have that assurance of what it is that one can say that you know that you're going to heaven. And you think in your heart and you think to yourself, that person is either arrogant, is either presumptuous, or they've got some high inflated view of themselves, and I don't know where it comes from. Now, no one likes someone who knows everything. And uh, someone who's a know-all can soon get on one's nerves. But when you read the Bible, as we looked last week, even there, for example, in verse 26, the Christian does not know, does not know what we should pray for, as we ought. And there are many things in the Christian life that we are uncertain about. And even in our own lives, we are uncertain. We do not know why things have happened. We do not know the road we have gone down, and we cannot make sense of it all. But we do know this, that when a person does become a Christian, there is something that you are to experience in this world of uncertainty, and it's that assurance that one day you will be with God in heaven. You will know the blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are reasons 
why people are unsure about this knowledge. There are some Christians which lack it. And one of the reasons is simply this, is perhaps bad teaching which has been given to them. That is now that things have depended upon them, wrong teaching which has been given to them, inadequate teaching in the life of the church. They never heard of such a thing that one day you could, you could actually be saved and you could know it in the past tense, even in this world in which we live. And that's why then we've come now to these verses 28 and to 30, where you've got now the very purposes of God which are being worked out. And simply this morning, three things I want to bring out to you. And the first is this, from this well-known verse, although we find it hard to accept, in verse 28, for we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And that this day, there's this wonderful proclamation, and if we could actually speak to you pastorally, that all things in your life are working to this end, which are then for good. And then secondly, you'll find it in verse 29, not just for any good, but in verse 29, for we whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. And the ultimate good which God has for you this day, and may it be a means of motivation this morning, that God wants each and every one of you to be like and to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And thirdly then, in verse 30, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And listen carefully, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. And that his wonderful purpose is this, that you would know what it is, that you are glorified in then in him. And first of all, simply this, that first verse, that all things in one's life uh, have for this purpose that works then for good. Verse 28, for we know all things work together for good to those who love God. Now, when we take that verse, we don't take it glibly. Can you imagine this day of writing that verse out on a big uh, a placard and a sign and walking across then the Ukraine Eastern Front into those towns and villages with this verse of Romans 8, 28. That would be one hard thing to do. And it would be a very hard thing to do, will it be, to walk into any hospital with a placard over your chest with Romans 8, 28. For we know all things work together for good to those who have cancer, and those who are grieving uh, by the side of a, of a loved one who is passing away. And it's very difficult, is it not, to write on any card uh, to those then who have been diagnosed, who have lost a job and who have lost a loved one. To write that verse then to them would be difficult at any time. And we need to qualify it on two accounts. When we say that all things work together for good, it means this, not firstly that everything that happens in this world is good, but that God can work it for good. And neither does it mean that this is true for all, but it's for all those, as we know, who are called according to his purpose. It is not all good, but it is all good for those who are called according to to his purpose. And firstly, see, you find it when you think of this world in which we live. Just take the broad picture for a moment. The history of this world has been filled with utter terrible atrocities which have taken place. And yet, when you find and you go and look at history's uh, stream and river, Yet through all the badness which is hidden, uprisings of nations and genocides which happen, 
There is one who's on the throne who is able to have turned these things that we can live in a world and Christ's kingdom can come. We're not saying for one moment these things are good. This book tells it like it is. Evil is always evil and not good. Hate is always hate and not good. Lies is always lies and not truth. And you find it here, but there is one who can work. I don't know if you've been following uh, only lately again of that revival which is taking place in Iran. Iran, over 25, 30 years ago, was one of the most oppressive Islamic extremist uh, dictatorships in the world. And now this week, they decided, and you know the oppression of women and the wearing of headscarves and all the rest of it. But now there's come such a place there that they can no longer imprison the Christians which are in the country and they can only now imprison the leaders of the church. That which oppressed in so many ways, you see, which was bad and which was evil and of a false religion, God now has worked in that very country to bring it then to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We know of the news in which you have had this week, and we cannot even begin to imagine of the effect of the lives which were taken, and not only that, but the families affected there in Nottingham, and uh, the senseless. You can't make a rhyme or reason about it. And then you are listening to the news, and there were those members of the family uh, thanking the people who have come together for their support and their love. I'm just saying that in an atrocity like that, which these people will live with for the rest of their lives, yet even they could find that it brought those people and told us not to hate, but to sincerely then love. Now these things happen, and they happen on so many occasions, where things have happened in people's lives which have been simply bad. But then you have the testimony, and we'd be lying if we did not say it, that people have found there's been forgiveness with God, which they would never have found in, in any other way. They have found a hope where they thought there was no hope, and they have found a love of God that they may have never have found if it wasn't for something that had happened in their lives. And in your own life, you could know something of this, where you may be this morning, no doubt about it, it's not good. You're in a bad place, a bad place. And you can do your mental gymnastics, but at the end of the day, the situation you're in is bad. But there's a God who can take that bad place and that experience and shape it and use it for his good, for his kingdom, and for his kingdom even in your life. You may know this morning of what it is to be in a bad relationship. And that relationship can destroy you. It can bring you down. It can make you as nothing. But God has a way in one's life where he can even use that, as we'll see, that will be a means of doing something more than we could ever have imagined. In the experiences that we have now, you're going through the bad time, but God can use them. And in that years to come, now only the Christian, the Christian looks back and begins to see something of this. This is not glib. This is simply telling you that in those things that you've gone through, the Christian comes and begins to realize that those things were, well, they, they were bad. But some good has come from it. And you begin to realize that. You've lost your job. But in that losing of your job, there's been a greater commitment which has taken place in the things of Christ. You have an accident, a car accident, that's made you rely on God more than you would ever have done in your past. A loved one has walked out and you begin to realize there's only one that can really love you. 
and the real love that you've got is that love you see which is from God and you've begun to look at that and, and without those things you would not have gone down that path and experienced this within your own life. There are things which happen and there's been much pain. You think of the examples we've got in Scripture. <clears throat> You've got the man Joseph. You all know Joseph and his amazing technical court. And the story is this, that his own brothers, they betrayed him and sold him into slavery. There was a man who knew what it was to be falsely accused and placed into prison. And he was there for years. And then you see <coughs> from that experience, there was there, God was performing a work by which he would then be the saviour of a nation. And when his brothers came to him, he said those words, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And you can take that even in the ways of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, where it says when Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and says those words, you took him, you uh, killed him, you crucified him, but you see, God, God foreordained it. They would be for your salvation. And God meant it for good. Now, there comes a moment in our lives, it's just simply speaking, we need to know, because as he tells us here, we're not immune to it. In verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. And when you're going through those sufferings, I do not know, I cannot tell. The way he has for me, I just do not know it. I, and then we also come and experience that although we have gone through dark times, there is one who has meant it for good. And that is every single experience in your life, every one of them, not just that one and that one and that one, but the whole lot of them placed together, God has been working a purpose out in your life. There may be someone who's not a Christian. I tell you where you are today. You don't know the reason you're born. You don't know why you're living. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know where you're going. You have no meaning. This aimless life, the futility of life, your destiny in the stars, You've got no thought that happens each and every day. But the Christian knows. He says, for those who are called according to his purpose. There may be someone here today and saying, is that really true? Others will be saying, that is not true. There'll be some of you saying, I hope it's true. Another saying, I wish it's true. And the Christian says, I know it's true. And there's something that you know in this world of uncertainty. But look now at verse 29. It, it's something else that we've told here. For whom he foreknew. Remember, the non-Christian doesn't know. The Christian does know. <laughs> but the wonderful word here is that God foreknows, and so it is not only for your good, but for now your ultimate good, that uh, what God has planned for you in one's life, in this verse he says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now let me just explain two big words in this verse. The first word is foreknow. Now, there's something we understand about God is this, is that God definitely foreknows. That's part of the aspect of, of being God. He is the one who knows everything. And in Psalm 139, we read those wonderful words. He knows your, your standing up. He knows your sitting down. 
He knows everything which is going to be on your lips before you even say it. He knows the thoughts in your head even before you think it. He knows the days in which you have to live. He knows all that. You don't know it, but God knows it. But when he speaks here of foreknowing, it doesn't simply just mean that he just knows everything because the Bible speaks of it in a more intimate kind of way. I know some people think, well, well, what happens is this, is that uh, God knows everything and knew one day that I would become a Christian and I would believe and so he predestined me. That's not what it says. Do you know what the Bible says? It says this. I'll try and do it as gently as I can. But in Genesis chapter 4, I think, in verse 1, and it says this, that Adam knew Eve in an intimate way. There was a knowledge. And when the Bible speaks that God foreknew, he speaks of it in this sense of what it is that he has put his love and in a special relationship with them. I'll give you this verse from Amos chapter 3 and verse 2. And he's speaking to his people. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. And you say, well, what's that? Well, God obviously knows all the families of the earth. But you only have I known in that special and an intimate way. And that's why when we read in the wonderful book of Jeremiah, he can say these words because it's true. I have loved you with an everlasting love. He's loved you before this world was made. He loved you in eternity. He loved you from, from everlasting to everlasting. He loved you way before you were ever a twinkle in your mother's eye or your father's eye. You, he's loved you before planets were put into place. He knew you. And that's what he's telling. For whom he put his love upon. He says, do you know what he did? He predestined. Predestined. And I know those words, they say, oh, I don't like the words predestined. They're wonderful words. I tell you what it is. It means that you've got a destiny. And uh, God has pre prescribed the destiny that you have. Now, isn't that wonderful news? Because there be those today when you're going in this world and you meet someone and they say something like this. It was destiny. We were meant for each other. You only have to listen to what people speak of on these chat shows. And it was like if it was written in the stars that I should live in this place. And others will say, well, it, it's a, a fate and they talk in these terms. But, but listen, God, God has a, a destiny for you. And what he's telling us is that you've been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And your life is on a track as a Christian, which is heading that direction. Just as when you catch a train, you know it, it's very simple. You go to Narbeth, you don't do what I do. You go to Carmarthen and you get on the Tembi train. No, you look at the sign and you say, as it comes in, this is Whitland bound. And you say, I know it's that place. It's destined. And so it is for the Christian. Now what he tells us here, it is truly remarkable. Actually, this verse, verse 29, was one of the first teachings that I was taught when I first became a Christian. And it was mind-blowing that now for your life has a purpose, has a meaning, and that God wants to do something in your life. You've been saved from your aimless and your futile ways. You know, for a world which has no hope, no future, don't know why we are here and what it's all about. I was taught as in the very first lesson, although now you've become a Christian, God wants to do something with you and he wants to conform you to the image of his son. This is the ultimate good. And this is how he does it. 
I'm just going to speak in three little ways on how he does it. First of all, what he does is that he makes you a child of God. What happens is when we are born, we are born after the earthly man, the natural man. But God's got a plan that we'll be born after the heavenly man, the spiritual man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, just as we may look like our parents in some ways, have you ever, have you ever looked at those old photos in the family? And what's really uncanny about those photos is that the older I get, the more I'm looking like they were my grandfather just as he was at that age. But God has got another project that you will be conformed into the image of his son. And what he does, he gives you that birth which is from above. You've been born again with the heavenly spirit. You've been renewed according to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It begins with that experience. And you know in that experience, he, what he does then is that he, he, it's not the end, it's just the beginning. Then you find that he is going to be moulding you and shaping you, although you will realise he's been doing that even long before you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. But you had to be brought to your knees. You had to repent before him. Those experiences you had brought you to conversion, to call upon him. And then what happens is this. He begins to work because you ought to be like him. Shall I tell you one of the things about the Lord Jesus Christ? Was his relationship with the Father it was absolutely unique. He was always speaking to him and talking to him. He had communion with him. Jesus Christ was close to his Father. And you know what God does in your life? You may not realise it. But through those difficult, trying times, the life-changing, breaking experiences, you say, I don't know what they were for. Well, can't you say this? They were for this. They brought you to God. You come closer to him. At those times, you prayed to him and you called upon him. Now, I've gone through experiences, and I will say to you that experiences I never want to go through ever again in one's whole life. I would never choose it. I would never want it. But you know, having gone through it, I'd never change it. Never change it. Because of what it did in making one rely and come you know, to God himself and to know him. And those things are happening in your very experience. And then he does something else in your life. He comes that you will be like him in his, his morality, in uh, your life that you live, in purity, in holiness, in singleness of eye in living now, not for this world, but for God. And do you know how he does it? He does it with the people he puts around you. And uh, the circumstances that you go through. That what happens is, you know, how little things just seem to get on your nerves and make you irritable. And the attitudes that we have, because he wants to create in you a kindness and a patience and a goodness and a gentleness and a self-control and these things which you think they are just small and my life is above all this. God is coming and shaping you in the image of his son. And here's the great thing as he tells us in verse 25, 9, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And Jesus Christ this day, who comes and has risen from the dead and is seated in glory and now is there, he was the firstborn. That's your destiny. It's heaven. It's glory. If you've suffered with him, you will reign with him also. All things work together for good. All things work together for 
this ultimate good, let that motivate you in your life, that God has a plan, and in your experiences, that you would be like Jesus. And that is something good. Just one more thing, because it is then glory. Moreover, in verse 30, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now here's his plan, and you must listen to it, that when you have come and know something of Jesus Christ, he's telling us now that those whom God has predestined, he called. I'm going to read you uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And although then God has predestined our destiny, there was a moment in time where we were called. In a service like this, and in your life, God has been calling you. He has called you to himself through the gospel of Jesus. Telling you, reaching out to you in his great love and mercy, and in moments and experiences of hearing someone minister and preach, there is this calling from God. But when he is calling, there are those he has predestined who will hear that call. Our years are deaf. We're dead to God. But he is the one who gives the irresistible call. And the word is simply like this. There's a summons which is given to us to come to him. And the Lord Jesus Christ said this, when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. And there's a moment and a day in one's life where you come to Jesus. You actually put that step towards him. It doesn't matter how big that step you take, how small that step may be, how much in the moment you reach out to him who has said, to repent and to believe. And you say, Lord, help me. I come. He's the one who has been calling you to him. That's his purpose in your life. And you were brought to that. You may not have realized it, but you uh, came to a place such as this, a church you hadn't been to uh, for years and years. And then now you're listening to voices which are from the throne itself, from heaven and not of earth, power and authority, truth that you've never experienced, feeling uncomfortable in one's heart. It's all there. And then you come. And once you've come to Jesus Christ, look what he does. Whom he called, he justified. That moment a person believes in him, a pardon he receives you find it in verse 24 of chapter 3, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You come to him, and once you come to him, he justifies you. That means he declares you right. Therefore, by faith, we have peace with God having been justified in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a glorious thing to know. You are a person who is righteous in his sight. But it's not the end. He has glorified you. Here it is. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. I'm just not going to be long. I'm just going to tell you, mark it down. Think about it. You say, this is a bit different. I've not heard of it. Well, put it in your pipe and smoke it because you need to do that 
because whom he justified, these he also glorified. In the past tense, when God says something, it is done. When God decrees, you know it will happen. When God says this is it, it is definitely for certain. And when God says these great and wonderful words, I've loved them, I've destined them, I've called them, I've justified them, I've glorified them. And so it is this day. And there are those which are saints in heaven. They may be uh, more glorified than what we are at this present time. But they're not more secure. Not more secure. And so it is that we know that's before us. If I could use, as Dr. Martin put it, and it's worth saying, he says, when you read these verses, it's not like this, that God foreknows a hundred people. He then predestines 80 people. He then calls, you know, 40 people. He then justifies 20 people and then glorifies 10 people. It's not like that. Once he has foreknown, he's predestined, he's called, he's justified, he's glorified. It's a great message, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is. You need, we need to know. And part of it today, of that assurance that, that, that God is working in your life, you say, oh, is he against me? No, of course not. That'll be the next verse. God's for you. He really is. And those things which are happening, which are bringing you to your knees, God's working out the ultimate good that you would be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can be sure today, whoever has put themselves into his hands, you will one be, be like him, glorified, even in heaven, with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen.